am in the village of Cimarron in New Mexico, and this is the Aztec Mill. The hours are basically 10 to 4, Monday through Saturday. Let's dive right in. Welcome to Cimarron, New Mexico, a gateway to the Wild West and home to one of the state's oldest industrial landmarks, the Aztec Mill. In this video, we'll explore the rich history of this mill, the people who shaped the land, and the famous figures who passed through Cimarron from its early days to the present. Cimarron's story begins long before the mill's construction. Nestled in the foothills of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, this area was originally inhabited by Native American tribes like the Hikaria Apache and the Ute. For centuries, these indigenous peoples thrived off the land, hunting, gathering, and engaging in trade. The arrival of Spanish explorers in the 16th century marked the beginning of significant changes. This is Cimarron's famous two-headed calf, which was found on W.S. Ranch by Clyde Malone in 1937. In the 1700s, Spanish settlers began establishing ranches and missions across northern New Mexico. Lucian Maxwell founded the first permanent settlement on the Bubian and Miranda land grant at Rayado in 1848. Upon acquiring ownership of the land grant in 1857, Maxwell moved to Cimarron, where he ruled his land much like a feudal lord. After amassing a fortune through ranching, mining, and supplying goods to the local Indians, Maxwell sold his land in 1869 to an English syndicate for $1,350,000. The Cimarron region, rich in natural resources, became a focal point along the Santa Fe Trail for trade and settlement, setting the stage for the town's future development. The modern history of Cimarron is deeply tied to one man. His name was Lucian Maxwell. In 1841, Maxwell married into the influential Bent family, inheriting what would become one of the largest land grants in U.S. history. It was nearly 1.7 million acres. Maxwell's vision transformed this vast territory into a thriving economic hub attracting settlers, miners, and traders. Under Maxwell's leadership, Cimarron became a critical stop on the Santa Fe Trail. The region's economy flourished with ranching, farming, and mining operations springing up across the land. But with progress came conflict. Tensions between settlers and indigenous tribes escalated. In 1864, Lucian Maxwell built the Aztec Mill, a two-story stone structure that quickly became a vital part of Cimarron's economy. The mill was unique for its time, not only for its size, but also for its role in supporting the local community. It ground wheat, corn, and other grains, providing essential supplies to both settlers and the Native American populations. 
The mill operated using water power from the nearby Cimarron River, symbolizing a blend of traditional and innovative methods. The Aztec mill stood as a testament to Maxwell's ambition and the growing prosperity of the region. Despite its early success, the region faced significant challenges. The Maxwell land grant was a source of controversy, leading to disputes over land ownership. The notorious Colfax County War in the late 1870s epitomized the chaos as violence erupted between landowners, settlers, and squatters. As the conflicts intensified, Cimarron's prosperity waned. The Aztec Mill, once a symbol of the town's growth, began to fall into disrepair. By the late 19th century, the mill had ceased operations and Cimarron's population dwindled as people moved away in search of better opportunities. Cimarron, positioned on the trail, was more than just a small frontier town. It was a crossroads where some of the most legendary figures of the American West passed through. Each brought their own story, their own purpose, and left a mark on Cimarron's rich history. Perhaps the most famous visitor of all was Kit Carson, the famed frontiersman and explorer. Kit Carson had a close relationship with Lucian Maxwell, often visiting Cimarron. His role as an Indian agent and his numerous expeditions in the West made him a legendary figure, and his time in Cimarron was a testament to the town's importance in the broader tapestry of the American frontier. Carson's connection to Cimarron was more than just a passing visit. His friendship with Maxwell and his involvement in various conflicts with Native American tribes brought him to the region frequently. His presence highlighted the strategic importance of Cimarron in the westward expansion and the complex relationships between settlers and indigenous populations. Another iconic figure to pass through Cimarron was William Buffalo Bill Cody. Known for his Wild West shows that captivated audiences around the world, Cody's life was a blend of reality and myth. He visited Cimarron as part of his travels across the West, recruiting cowboys and sharpshooters for his shows. Cody's time in Cimarron further solidified the town's place in the mythology of the American West. Cimarron also saw its fair share of notorious figures such as Clay Allison, a rancher, gunfighter, and one of the most feared men of the Old West. Allison was known for his volatile temper and deadly aim. He frequented Cimarron's saloons and was involved in several violent encounters in the area. His presence added to Cimarron's reputation as a rough-and-tumble frontier town where lawlessness often reigned. The town was also a hideout for outlaws like Black Jack Ketchum, a notorious train robber and gang leader. Ketchum and his gang used the rugged terrain around Cimarron to evade capture. His criminal exploits and eventual capture are part of the dark yet fascinating history of Cimarron during its days as a lawless frontier outpost. It's the creepy doll section. <laughs> Seems like that's a must in a lot of museums. The Earp brothers, including Wyatt Earp, 
later famous for the gunfight at the OK Corral, also passed through Cimarron. Their journeys brought them to various towns across the West, and while their time in Cimarron was brief, it was a reminder of how interconnected the Old West truly was. In the early 20th century, Cimarron inspired the works of Zane Grey, who is a popular Western novelist. Grey visited Cimarron while researching for his novels, captivated by the stories and landscapes of the region. His works helped immortalize the spirit of Cimarron and the American West in literature. For decades, the Aztec mill stood as a silent witness to Cimarron's tumultuous history. But in the mid-20th century, efforts to preserve this historic site gained momentum. The mill was restored and transformed into a museum showcasing the artifacts and stories of Cimarron's past. Today, the Aztec Mill is more than just a museum. It's a monument to the resilience of the Cimarron community. The mill and the town around it remind us of the frontier spirit that once defined the American West. As we look to the future, Cimarron remains a town steeped in history. The community here is dedicated to preserving its heritage while embracing new opportunities for growth. Whether it's through tourism, education, or local initiatives, the legacy of the Aztec Mill and the people of Cimarron continue to inspire. Here's a quote from Lou A. Wallace, who is the governor of Territorial New Mexico from 1878 to 1881. Every calculation based on experience elsewhere fails in New Mexico. This is the medicine cabinet. It's uh, Dr. Bass's pill box. Still got pills in it. In an editorial in the Las Vegas Gazette on July 26, 1875, somebody wrote, quote, Against Lucian B. Maxwell, no man can say aught, and he died after an active and eventful life, probably without an enemy in the world. A few words, unassuming and unpretentious, his deeds were the best exponent of the man. He was hospitable, generous, and upright, and dispensed large wealth acquired by industry and genius, and with an open hand to the stranger and to the needy." End quote. In an advertisement from the Aztec Mill, Reinhardt begs leave to inform his friends and the public generally that having recently taken the above well-known and old-established mills, he intends to conduct the business there in the best manner at the lowest prices. New and complete machinery will be added, enabling Reinhardt to produce flour of quality not to be surpassed in the territory, as a trial will show. He gave a list of reduced prices, and his customers will always have the immediate benefits of a range in the markets. In the list of prices, you have extra flour per sack, $5.25. Extra super fine, $4.75. Fine is $4. Bran at 100 pounds is $2.25. Cornmeal per sack is $5. Corn and grain per 100 pounds, $2. Shortenings, 50 cents. And then no price is listed for chopped feed for cattle of all kinds. And it says the highest market price is given in cash for every description of grain in large or small quantities. And this was from the Cimarron News on September 14, 1872.
So now, I'm gonna give you a little bit of history on the chuck wagon. Not an inch of space is wasted on the chuck wagon. Under the driver's seat is a box holding smaller tools and items necessary for the job. Come and get it, or I'll throw it in the creek. Cookie hollers to the drovers who come running. Food on the range is not to be ignored. A black pot hangs over the crackling campfire, smells of cedar and stew mingling. Freshly baked biscuits and thundering hot coffee top off the meal. Cowboys, drovers, trail bosses, and everyone associated with herding cattle hunker down to shovel in a plate of chuck, from fried steaks to beans to stew. Barefoot coffee, which is without cream or sugar, tops the meal. At the end of the Civil War, in the mid-1860s, a massive expansion of settlement moved westward across North America, creating a large market for beef. This beef existed on the hoof, primarily in Texas. Enterprising cattlemen recognized the need to move herds to market without railroads, which meant driving cattle overland. Trail drive days were born. To move a herd, cowhands lived on the range for months at a time. The need to feed and care for these men resulted in the development of the chuck wagon. Before the official chuck wagon came to be, many ranches moved cattle using a supply wagon. The famous cattle drives began in earnest in 1866, but Longhorn cattle had been driven to Louisiana before 1836. From 1865 to 1890, drovers trailed as many as 10 million herd toward Kansas and Missouri rail yards, with many drives lasting five months. A few went as far as Canada. Before the invention of chuck wagons, cowboys had to supply their own food and fix it themselves after a long day herding beefs. Charles Goodnight, Texas rancher and co-founder of the Goodnight Loving Trail, saw a need to hire top hands, but, he thought, they shouldn't have to cook their own grub, too. How could he then entice the best to ride with him? It all boiled down to food. In 1866, he bought a Studebaker army wagon and hired a trail cook with a solid reputation. Together, they figured out what was needed while out on the trail. He attached a toolbox to one side and a water barrel to the other. The all-important coffee grinder was affixed outside the pantry box. At the rear was the chuck box designed by Goodnight. Filled with drawers and shelves, it held groceries, cooking utensils, tins, plates, and silverware known as eating irons. These shelves were covered with a hinged lid that dropped down on a swinging leg to form a cook's work table. The crew's bedrolls were packed into the wagon bed, as were flour sacks and other provisions. Supplies, tools, bedding, and small water barrels were stored up front. Beneath the chuck box was a boot to hold larger items, such as the ever-present Dutch oven. The average wagon was 10 feet long by 38 to 40 inches wide. From the original concept, Goodnight added heavier running gear that would stand up to rugged country. This design became so popular that in 1880, Studebaker created a model called the Roundup Wagon. At the heart of every cow outfit, the chuck wagon was referred to as simply the wagon. It was a cowboy's commissary, locker room, hospital, tack room, post office, and social club. Cookie's word was law around the campfire. He was king of the chuck, the most important man in any cattle outfit. A good cook was paid good wages, twice to triple what a cowhand earned. Referred to as Koozie or Cookie, he also had the handles of Soggy, Pot Rustler, Dough Boxer, Dough Puncher, Old Lady, Sourdough, Belly Cheater, Greasy Belly, Crop Worm, Gut Robber, and other colorful monikers. Sourdough was a staple and cooks nurtured their dough keg. A typical day's food on the trail consisted of fresh meat, hot bread, dried fruit, and coffee for breakfast. Noon and evening meals included roast beef, broiled potatoes, beans, brown gravy, light bread or biscuits, as well as coffee. Dessert could be stewed dried fruit, dried fruit pies, or spotted pup, which is boiled rice and raisins. Ranches today continue to use chuck wagons when the hands are sent to round up cattle or need to stay on the range more than a day or two. 
The American Chuck Wagon Association, formed in 1997 with members in 31 states, Canada, Germany, and France, encourages participants to preserve this important part of American history. They sponsor educational and competitive events that involve setting up camp, cooking, using authentic Old Western tools, and showing their restored or replicated chuck wagons. Nothing inspires admiration and love for the West more than standing around a campfire on a chilly morning, aromas of baking biscuits and frying meat mingling with the mouth-watering wafts of hot coffee. An added bonus, watching the sunrise above a forest of yellow-leafed aspen. Thank you for joining me on this journey through Cimarron's history. The Aztec Mill stands as a bridge between the past and the future, a reminder of where we've come and the road that lies ahead. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more stories and for my travels as I travel along this great American road. See you next time.